afternoon, dear professor and colleague who attended the oral presentation at the virtual ACPM, which was held on 23 until 24 August 2022. My name is Edward Faisal. I'm an internal medicine physician from Indonesia. Now, I'm working as a staff of psychosomatic and palliative in Universitas Indonesia, Faculty of Medicine. While being active as a staff, I do continue to study and sharpen my knowledge in subspecialty in psychosomatic. First of all, we physicians from Indonesia would like to congratulate the ACPM committee on the implementation virtual ACPM during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a honor that ACPM committee has invited me and our colleagues, Dr. Rudi Putranto and Dr. Hamza Satri, to share our experience and discuss it in this virtual event. Now, I will discuss about the effectiveness zinc preparation for anxiety and depression is an evidence-based clinical report. First, I would like to discuss about the introduction of this article. Anxiety and depression are a global burdens of health-related social problems. The effort to reduce the symptoms of this disorder are still being carried out today. And many studies have been carried out to cure it. Especially now, the era of COVID-19, anxiety and depression are more prevalent. In the elderly, the prevalence of depression is 42.2%. And the anxiety is 52.2%. Overall, we will find anxiety and depression at all ages. How about the risk factors that associate with anxiety and depression? The risk factors are female person, and then the persons who have illness and quite severe, and then the medical comorbidities and poor social support. The younger age, more prevalent in anxiety, but the older age, more prevalent in depression. Other risk factors for depression are smoking and higher education levels. Anxiety and depression can occur due to a lack of micronutrient, namely zinc. Zinc is one of the trace elements, has a role in the emergence and development of various life stages that affect mood disorder. Zinc is the second most common trace element required for proper brain development and function. Insufficiency zinc can affect neurological system as well as neurodegenerative system and can cause disease of the death origin from the brain, such as depression, anxiety, dementia, Alzheimer disease, and many more. Several studies have shown that the enhancement of zinc in major depression can be more effective in reducing depressive symptoms. In our body, there is competition between zinc and other nutrients, such as iron, calcium, copper, selenium, and vitamins. Shall we continue? about the clinical questions in Indonesia. This is our patient, a woman, 19 years old, came to the clinic with a chief complaint about one month if her speech felt slower than usual and anhedonia. 
She had been feeling depressed this past few weeks. The symptoms get worse about three months. Sometimes she forgot that what she wanted to say. She had thought about committing suicide, but she didn't do it because she knew it was a sin. She became a person who lacked communication since she was bullied in the second grade junior high school. At the age of one year, she was beaten by her mate, and it still has an imprint on her. The patient has been given the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, the one class for depression. Now, she wants to try another supplemental medicine to add to her medication. She asks about the effectiveness of zinc preparation for her illness besides SSRI. A comprehensive literature search was conducted on April 2022 to answer the question which is depicted with PICO. We exploring several online databases such as PubMed, Cochrane Library, Epscohost, and Google Scholar. The keywords are zinc, anxiety, and depression, combined with pollen operator and or, or. Articles obtained were screening according to predetermined selection criteria. The peak of this patient is the population is anxiety and depression. The intervention is zinc supplementation for the comparison with the intervention one is standard treatment. So we hope the outcome is improvement of symptoms, anxiety, and depression. The study be limited to five years. The inclusion criteria included about four domain. One, the research article including meta-analysis, systematic review, randomized control trial, studies examining zinc preparation. Second, adult population with, uh, with anxiety and or, or depression. Third, determining the effectiveness of zinc preparation and the last all outcome. The other than inclusion criteria include other language and then English, we has been excluded. A comprehensive literature search, there were 26,255 articles obtained over searching through online base. After full text reading, there, were, there was only one article found to be matched to answer the clinical question. We can see in the flow chart strategy, the article is from the Silva et al. We can use to this EBCR. This is the critical appraisal of meta-analysis. It has been reviewed based on criteria of CEBM University of Oxford. So after meeting the inclusion and exclusion criteria, every article will be assessed for its validity importance and applicability by using the CABM from Oxford and the result can apply in our organization. Now we begin the discussion. Zinc is a trace element essential needed by the body to do proper functioning of the brain. Brain function requires one of the important signals from zinc. The concentration are high in the hippocampus and amygdala. Zinc energetic system disorders can cause neuropsychological disorder such as depression. Diet with insufficient zinc can reduce synaptic concentrations and increase glutamonergic neurotransmission. 
Zinc modulates excitatory glutaminergic and inhibited GABAergic neurotransmission. Zinc deficiency can increase levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which can damage brain and serotonin function. Vice versa, depression can contribute to zinc deficiency. About the dietary zinc intake, they at all uh, from study Lee et al. showing that it is significantly associated with a reduced risk of depression. Zinc supplementation may reduce depressive symptoms in individuals treated with antidepressant drug for clinical depression. Other study that support the role of zinc, which is study Sumaker et al. have been done in Indonesia uh, last time, 2022, in this year, and then Sumaker result a significant positive correlation between zinc intake and serum serotonin level. It is statistical significant, but not with serum cortisol level. From the P, we can see that it is no statistical, statistical significance. Almost all the study analyzed by the Silva et al. Use a zinc preparation about 25 milligram daily for about two until three months for the intervention, and only use a zinc preparation of seven milligram daily for two weeks. In line with study of Zali, show positive result from intervention with zinc 30 milligram daily for about 70 days. Significantly decrease in mean scores, anxiety, and depression. Uh, the study from Aljali is almost similar with study from the Silva, but the study and Barry note me at all show that in elderly there were no significant relationship between anxiety and depression and the dietary zinc intake. The study informed that no significant correlation between dietary and serum zinc. The correlation is very, very poor because the R is 0.08 and the P is more than 0.05. Okay, I will continue with the strength and limitation from this article. The strength was carried out in four major scientific literature databases. The risk of bias in the selected publication was assessed. There were no restrictions on search date and was conducted by at least two independent researchers. The studies analyzed were heterogeneously distributed. So it can be concluded that this research can be applied in real life. The limitation of this article is just encompasses one meta-analysis. And then the conclusion of this article, one of stress elements that is useful to treating anxiety and depression is zinc. It is easily obtaining from the food, but the consumption is still low. Therefore, supplementation is needed. The supplementation of zinc on psychopharmacology contributed to a significant reduction in anxiety and depressive symptoms. Research indicating a relationship between effectiveness supplementation, zinc, and anxiety depression is still scarce. Studies of zinc preparation need to be carried out in certain doses and durations in order to find a definite time for the administration of adjunctive therapy for anxiety depression patients. Based on this EBCR article, we plan to conduct future research to determine the role of zinc in depression and anxiety. That's all my presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon.
dear professor and colleague who attended the oral presentation at the virtual ACPM, which was held on 23 until 24 August 2022. My name is Edward Faisal. I'm an internal medicine physician from Indonesia. Now I'm working as a staff of psychosomatic and palliative in Universitas Indonesia, Faculty of Medicine. While being active as a staff, I do continue to study and sharpen my knowledge in subspecialty in psychosomatic. First of all, we physicians from Indonesia would like to congratulate the ACPM committee on the implementation virtual ACPM during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a honor that ACPM committee has invited me and our colleagues Dr. Rudi Putranto and Dr. Hamza Satri to share our experience and discuss it in this virtual event. Now, I will discuss about the effectiveness zinc preparation for anxiety and depression is an evidence-based clinical report. First, I would like to discuss about the introduction of this article. Anxiety and depression are a global burden of health-related social problems. The effort to reduce the symptoms of this disorder are doctor and other colleague. Uh, before I give my presentation, I would like to thank you to the committee to allow us to join these uh, presentations. And thank you for the committed for the Congress of the Asian College of uh, Psychosomatic Medicines for the time that they gave us for the personal questions. I would like to present about the effect of music therapy for improving the quality of life in patients with cancer pain. My name is Ibrahim Ahmad. I am from the Indonesia also from the Division of Psychosomatic and Palliative uh, Division, uh, Department of Internal Medicine, Faculty of Medicine of Universitas of Indonesia. For the introductions, uh, patients with cancer pain are often treated with combination of radiations, therapy, chemotherapy, tar targeted therapy, and also a surgery. 15% until 40% of patients with cancer are also suffer from physiological disorder associated with anxiety and depression during the therapy. And more than 50% feel pain. Based on the literature that we search, stress, like pain, infection, and other else, it can come, uh, come with the immune systems and endocrine functions. And it also can decrease the quality of life. For the initial therapy for the cancers to improving the quality of life can be given. We think that music can be a uh, distractor and effect for endorphins with all the natural painkillers of the body that can affect mood and maybe affect feelings and maybe raise hedonism up for treatments. If the music therapy can also reduce the pain and anxiety related to the cancer, then the music therapy can use as a low cost effective uh, for the palliative treatments. The case illustrations, it's a 41 years old female patients hospitalized in the internal medicine ward in our hospital, RSM. The patient has been diagnosed with right breast cancer since December 2021. The patient is, is admitted to the treatment because the body feels weak and has pain in the breast and never goes away. The first symptom was a lump in the right breast followed the bleeding from the areola of the breast. Then the patients went to the local hospital. A BOC was done and it's prob uh, probably a malignant tumor. Then the patient was reverted into the our hospital in RSM, where a repeated biopsy was performed and to determine the treatment. After the procedure, the surgical site and surrounding tissues slowly become large and painful. And during the hospitalizations, patients tend to be the uh, anxious, afraid, depressed, and often feel pain that is difficult to control. The patient has also been given with a strong opiate drugs according to the hour protocol, while the pain usually increases at a certain times. Especially in the patients feel lonely when the accompanying family leaves the patient alone in the hospital. For the clinical questions, this, does the music therapy have an effect on improving quality of life in the patient with cancer pain? 
For the PICO frameworks for the population, we included the patient with cancer pain for the interpretation, also the music therapy, the comparison we compare with the standard protocol and we look for the effectiveness of this music therapy. For the methods in the resources, we use SIGPATMED, Conference Library, and MBS Co-host. For the keyword, we use, we using uh, music therapy, cancer pain, and also combined with the operator. Included criteria, it's research articles, including meta-analysis, systemic review, and also the populations with cancer pain for determining efficiency of music therapy and findings were filtered for the five, uh, the, for the last five years. For the exclusion criteria, any clinical trials, case series, case report, review articles, and other study which were reported in English that other than English, and, and also not relevant with, to our PICO frameworks. Uh, from the database, PubMed, MBase, and Cochrane Library, we also uh, found 55 uh, articles that we screened. They had already that we look for the 55 from our search. There are also only three that full article assess for eligibility and three articles that study included in this ABCR. First of all, we had all 2019 is a systematic review and meta-analysis with uh, 19 trials with five, uh, 154,000 uh, patients with cancer. The determinants in music therapy, they the inclusion criteria in this systematic review is the population's coded cancer diagnosis and the control groups also the standard care such as conventional treatments, but care, standard treatment, and routine services. And as closing criteria is non-human studies, duplicate reports, and other else. For the primary outcomes, they look about the effectiveness of the music therapy and quality of life for anxiety, depression, and pain in patients with cancer. The second one is Paris Aza Guire et al. 2020. Uh, it included 19 articles with uh, determinants, also the same music therapy. And the uh, inclusion criteria is also like Ili at all. Uh, but the primary outcome there is not specified in this uh, systematic review. Uh, and the last one is Color at all, 2020. Uh, systematic review and meta analysis included 21 articles. The determinants of music therapy provided by the training therapist active and receptive interventions. And the inclusion criteria is participant in adult cancer at all stage interventions. Music therapy provides a trained therapist and active and receptive interventions. And for the comparators, waiting list group, treatment as usual group, active group, study design, and randomized control trials, and controlled clinical trials. For the primary outcome, the effectiveness of the music therapy on physiological well being, quality of life, and physical symptom distress. First of all, at all, 2000 uh, 19 is a systematic review. The title is also the effectiveness of music therapy for patient with cancer. It's a review, systematic review and meta analysis from Yen Vili. They screen more than 10,000 articles and they included only 19 articles. For the total 19 articles, 19 trial evaluating with 115. Uh, 48 patients were included, which of 765 were in control group and 783 in the experimental group. Uh, you can see the forest plot in the systematic review. The effect size of forest plot for the music therapy on the overall quality of life of the patients with cancer. This is so significant that combined the effect was observed of uh, uh, quality change in patients with cancer in the favor of music therapy. And you can also the, see the effects as the forest plot for the music therapy of different durations for overall quality of life in patients with cancer. There was also significant combined the effect that between the experimental group and control group when the duration of intervention was in one till uh, one more than one and less than two months of giving the musical therapy. But in the more of the two months or less than one month, uh, there's no significant for the music therapy in improving of quality of life. I'm sorry. The effect size for purpose for music therapy on pain with patient with cancer. Five trials covering uh, 381 patients evaluated for the effectiveness of music therapy as pain treatment in patient with cancer. Show that 
for this forest flood, there is a significant combined effect was observed in the pain change in patients with cancer. The second one is Kohler et al. 2020, a systematic review and meta-analysis. This is from Frederick Kohler. The title is Immunotherapy in Physiological Treatment of Adult Cancer Patients. They screen uh, more than 300 articles. They have included in this article only 20 ones. The music therapy overall had positive effect on a board range of outcome with tannic and effect varying at different pace during a curative treatment or for palliative settings. During the active treatment, the results were most promising with regards to the anxiety, depression, and pain medication intake. For the palliative settings, improvement with regards of quality life, quality of life, spiritual well-being, pain, and stress. We can see in the forest plot of the systematic review in Kohler at all 2021. This is the forest spot for physiological well-being. For the overall effect calculated for the rem-rem effect model was significant and small size. Uh, study was single session of the music therapy showed greater improvement than therapy programs involving the higher number of the sessions. And then the outcome were pain for the ninth study they included in this article. Uh, primary study showed the significant benefit of music therapy that both effect was small size and significant. One session led to the higher improvement for physical symptoms in comparison to control conditions. And the last for the Paris, uh, this Paris A. Query PhD, this is the title for Music Therapy Intervention and Relative Care. Uh, this article's objective is systematic review to analyze the type of musical of intervention that perform it uh, can give with the palliative treatment. Four of the studies is telling about new instruments are used as the monochord body tambura or singing chair or rhythm breath and lullaby. The number of music therapy sessions in the 19 studies analyzed range about one till five sessions with a mean of two sessions. Length of the two sessions in five of the studies duration is was uh, 30 minutes and the limitations uh, in this systematic review, there is no analysis and not clearly assessed for the effectiveness of uh, music therapy. For discussion for Amli et al. 2019, this systematic review analysis can show that music therapy could improve quality of life only in subgroup one of the two months durations. And the, the significant tell about the improvement of anxiety, depression, and also pain and half of the trials selected in this article were conducted in China, and significantly, statistical heterogeneity was observed in analysis of music therapy, the effect of anxiety and depression. This is influenced and related to the culture. And the limitations, there is no mention of method of the type of the, uh, the music they use. And then the core at all, 2021, the music therapy overall had positive effect on the board range outcomes with tonic and effect and varying different phase during the chemotherapy and radiation surgery and transportations, and also for aftercare, non-specific treatment was based. In the meta-analysis showed the significant effect of physiological well-being, physical symptoms, distress, and quality of life, and also for pain. I like the study at uh, Lee et al. 2019. This study shows one session is better than several sessions. There are some limitations in this a system material that should be considered in the study as such as the several studies could not be included in meta-analysis to insufficient data, High risk of bias in all study and all sample size in some studies, that factor might contribute to underpower analysis. And then for the Paris at all 2020, the systematic review, it showed the significant improvement in the standard stations of music interventions. The study showed the concern of performing of the effective of physical interventions, which are clearly ref uh, reflected in the research in order to assess which are the most efficient. The specific musical aspect of these interventions need to be described in the great depth of them to serve as guide and preparing music sessions. The music serve as the channel of the patient's communications and its use was distance with music therapy from other therapies. The limitation of this article, the physiological and spiritual support on many occasions of the music therapy provides in type of the populations and maybe the difference in uh, my country in Indonesia. For the conclusions of all Three systematic review results are the consistently show the effectiveness of music therapy towards the quality of life in cancer pain, and especially for pain. 
as the diagnosis and the treatment of cancer is often accompanied by challenging by physical symptoms, physical distress, and even small improvement through the music therapy may be relevant for patients with oncological disease. Future studies should explore the differences in the music therapy applications, such why the patient choose a particular style of music and what this means to them. Because no fixed procedure for music therapy exists and the different people should be given a different treatments. In published studies, both a systematic review and an original research lack information on how the holistic framework on home music therapy, such as the optimal time of the single music therapy and most appropriate musical styles. The accuracy of the future meta-analysis could be uh, substantially improved in subsequent trials, can consistently report a high quality of comprehensive evidence, and maybe long-term clinical trial with large patient sample are required in the future studies in order to demonstrate and more precise conclusions. Uh, thank you. This is for uh, uh, my presentation. Thank you so much. And now we must repeat presentation of Yanwar Adani, please. Amen. I'm very happy today can see you all in this program. Uh, today I will present my evidence-based case report. I think it's very, very interesting uh, because I will uh, talk about music therapy. Uh, but the first, let me introduce myself. My name is Yanuar Ardani. I'm an internist. I'm uh, from Semarang. Semarang is a central city, a literal city from central Java. And now I'm still study in Jakarta in uh, Division Psychosomatic and Palliative Department, uh, Internal Medicine in Cipto Mangun Kusumo, University Indonesia of Jakarta. Semarang is a little city, but it's a very beautiful city with uh, smiling people and honest people. Uh, and in Jakarta, all of you must be known that uh, that is a capital city from Indonesia. Okay, and, and today I use a very special cloth. Yeah, it's uh, the pride of my country. Uh, this cloth is the name is Batik, and my cap is called is Pechi. Okay, and now I will uh, share screen my uh, presentation. But uh, before we talk uh, or uh, far more about virtual music therapy, I think uh, the first we must uh, know what is uh, music therapy. Uh, so I will give example to you. Uh, what is music therapy? Uh, you can listen it. This is a traditional music therapy from Indonesia. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think that's very interesting. So I will uh, start my presentation. Uh, so the title is Effect of Virtual Music Therapy on Burnout Syndrome Among Healthcare Workers in uh, COVID-19 Pandemic Era. It's a evidence-based case report, and my name is Yanuar, and I make it with Dr. Rudy and Dr. Hamza, my teacher. So the background is uh, healthcare workers, they have a lot of psychological stress. Why? Because the limited knowledge about the disease and its treatment, high infection and mortality rates, and additional workload and overtime working is specific in the COVID pandemic era. Okay. And then we know that uh, burnout syndrome is physically and psychological stress due to hack workload and chronic stressor and work. So it's a lot of uh, healthcare worker, uh, they get it. So what is the very important component? The important component is physically and psychological. And this is make stress. 
the emotional exhaustion, the, comp the, the, the another important component is this is the three component. The first is emotional exhaustion, and then the depersonalization, personal, and then the last is personal accomplishment. So, uh, from Critical Care Society Collaborative, CCSC, uh, severe burnout syndrome is found uh, in the 25 until 33 percent nurse and on the 45 percent doctors. At least one of the three symptoms from that uh, is found in the 86 percent from total respondents. So, it is a very big uh, lot of. Uh, number, I think. So, the burnout syndrome can be manifest in the form of the first is psychological disorder, and then the second is physiological disorder. From psychological disorder, it can manifest with depression, sleep disturbance, and insomnia. And from physiological disorder, uh, they can manifest with disgusting disorder like constipation or diarrhea, and then immune response inflammatory. And then autonomy nerve respond. And then this is the diagram. Where is the stressor? We hope can prevent burnout syndrome with music therapy. Uh, clinical and evident based use of music as a therapy to achieve physical, emotional, mental, social, and cognitive needs. And then provided by a certified professional music therapist who has complete a training program. So the music can. Uh, has a two function, two uh, prime function. The first is stress reduction with lowering physical arousal such as heart rate, main arterial pressure, and lowering hormone level. And then the second is reduce negative emotion and feeling with reducing anxiety, nervousness, restlessness, and increasing positively feeling such as happiness, comfort, and joy. So this is my case illustration. A 32 years old woman worked as an intensive care unit nurse in the isolation room at a regional general hospital, which was a referral hospital in handling the COVID-19 pandemic. The symptom is extremely tired, state of having no energy, and feeling unhappy when going to work. Hard to wake up in the morning, feeling anxious about feeling anxious about patient condition and her family safety. It's like they so tempered, in focus, and have no empathy. Got in conflict with her co-workers and have no time and desire to do her hobbies. So, is the music therapy effective to be used for healthcare worker with burnout syndrome? So, I make the pico. The population is healthcare worker with burnout syndrome. And then, the intervention is music therapy. And then, uh, Compares, and then the outcome is improving condition. And then what is the methods? The methods, I, I'm looking for the uh, much, much resource from PubMed, Cochrane, Library, and EBSCO. And then uh, I use the keyword. The keyword is music therapy and burnout syndrome or stress and nurse or physician or healthcare workers. And the inclusion criteria is one. Number one is research article including meta-analysis, systematic review, cohort, case control, and randomized control trial. And then publication in the last five years and the patient with burnout syndrome. The exclusion is case series, case report, review article, other study which report language other than English not relevant to PICO. So this is the journal database. From PubMed, I found 28 journal, but after screen, I only get two. The Cochrane Library, I get 12, and after screen, I only get one. And from ESCO, I found 26, and after I screen, I only get one. So this is the diagram. You can see from PubMed is 28, from Cochrane is 12, and from ESCO is 40. But I only get two from PubMed, one from Cochrane, and one from EBSCO. And then there is a duplicate article, so I remove it. And then I reading full text of one article, and I found one useful article. One studies include case control. And then the result is from Kachem, 
case control where is the number of patient is 46 uh, from 46 34 is intervention and 12 loss to follow up intervention is music therapy inclusion criteria is all the staff member with an occupational seniority of more than one years existing exercise in the morning and who had expressed their oral consent to participate exclusion is staff member who refuse, who refuse to participate to the study and then they use drug effective to their central nervous systems chaotic or hearing disorder and the outcome is perceived stress scale average score improvement so this is the level evidence is 3b where is uh, was the assessment of patient to return randomized no and then what the group similar to at the start of the trial yes aside from the allocated treatment was the group treated equally yes so where all the patient who entered the trial account for and when the analysis on the group is therapy randomized yes but from the last is where measure objective or were the patient and clinicians keep plan to which treatment was being received is unclear okay this is the importance how large was the treatment effect how price was the estimate for the treatment effect so from the 46 operating room staff the rest two staff 12 staff members are excluded and then only uh, there are 34 operating staff participants with severe burnout syndrome had a significant improvement and after intervention decreasing, decreasing from 41.2 percent to 22 percent the p is 0 0.006 the emotional exhaustion score also decreased significantly from 22 plus minus uh, 10.8 until uh, to 19.2 plus minus 9.5 with p 0.004 so what about the applicability is my patient is so different to this no in the study that the result cannot apply no the study can apply uh, very easily is the treatment feasible in my setting yes will the potential benefit of treatment outweigh the potential harm yes and this is the discussion Research about the effect of music therapy on occupational stress and burnout risk of operating room staff. So that the music therapy can reduce burnout and severe stress symptoms of operating room staff significantly. What effect of music intervention on stress-related outcome? It is the study by Martina. There was positively effect of music and physiological change related to stress such as autonom, immune hormone and then and a traction from negative feeling safer and less side effect compared to use pharmacological treatment i think it's very true that this month but this must say that music therapy so not significant reduction of depression or maybe now uh, maybe for uh, depression patient is not 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 too much uh, effect but for burnout is have a good effect from silver men However, put author explicitly pointed out that there were positive change in the severity of depression after music therapy season for the experimental group. But uh, it has uh, limitation. The limitation is didn't analyze more about the type and characteristics of the music used as therapy. We know that F, we have a lot of general music uh, we can use, jazz, rock, and then that uh, traditional music that I uh, give example and then uh, after that we didn't conduct a general examination about hearing and spherical head of the person deeply only use anamnesis to get most of the emotion before conducting to the music therapy so I think it's made uh, objective uh, measure I think for the uh, best uh, for the better uh, research Therefore, further research is needed using bigger sample and physical examination need to be conducted properly before starting music therapy. And then, the last is conclusion. The conclusion is the use of music therapy as an alternative treatment for burnout syndrome is quite effective. There was a significant reduction in stress level after using therapy. However, further research is needed to provide more evidence to prove the effectiveness of music therapy on burnout syndrome to determine the best music characteristic that can be used based on genre, tempo, instrument, individual, or therapy, and how the music get chosen. This is the reference. Thank you for your uh, 
attention. Uh, I think I, I can stop this presentation and uh, maybe you can listen uh, again the music track. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Yanwar Ardani and your co-authors. And uh, now the next report, the role of psychotherapy in the management of post-COVID syndrome. Dika C. Nulinga and co-authors. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank you, the committee of the SCTM, for giving me the opportunity to present my EBCR. My name is Dika Iona Sinulinga. I am from Medan, North Sumatra, Indonesia. But I currently study in the psychosomatic and palliative Medicine Subspecialty Education Program in Universitas Indonesia in Jakarta, Indonesia. So let me share my, my presentation. This is my presentation with the title is the role of psychotherapy in management of post-COVID-19 syndrome and evidence-based clinical review. So for introduction, we know that COVID-19, which is caused by uh, several acute coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, is can have uh, long-term health consequences. Post-COVID-19 syndrome is defined as symptoms of COVID-19 continue for more than 12 weeks and cannot explain by alternative diagnosis. There are some synonyms, long-haul COVID, long COVID, post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection, and the long split sequelae and etc. The incidence is varied is about 10 until 35 percent. For hospital patients, it can reach to 85 percent. There are a wide range of symptoms from physical and psychological, which is fatigue is the most common symptom reported in 17.5 until 72 percent of post-COVID cases, while psychological symptoms is can reach to 26 percent patients. The persistence of fatigue around three months post infections can lead to moderate to severe depression and it will continue to worsen quality of life. A study from Huben Web et al. stated that 37.2% patients with confirmed COVID-19 will develop will develop PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, at three month follow-up, which remain high about 26.8% at six month follow-up. So the post-COVID-19 syndrome is not only affect the quality of life of patients and, and their families, but also will affect the healthcare system. Therefore, the PCS should be handled properly. Currently, there are limited evidence and understanding concerning management of PCS. Psychotherapy and psychological intervention seem to have a role in the management of PCS because uh, symptoms of PCS is some is uh, a psychological symptoms. Therefore, this EBCA aims to identify the effectiveness of psychotherapy in the management of PCS. Methods. A comprehensive literature searching was conducted on April 1, 2022. Uh, we use online databases such as PubMed, Cochrane, ProQuest, and Google Scholar. We use keywords psychotherapy, post-COVID-19 syndrome, post-acute COVID-19 syndrome, with the Boolean operator N and R. We use inclusion criteria such as first, research articles, there are meta-analysis, systematic reviews, RCTs, quantitative studies, mixed method studies, examining psychotherapy on management of PCS. Second is we use inclusion criteria is adult population. Third is full text articles in English or translated to Indonesian. And we don't use, so there are no limitation of publication time. The exclusion criteria is we don't use case series, we don't use case reports, and we don't use referral articles. This is the flowchart of the literature research and selection of studies. So uh, we found that 116 articles from PubMed 30, from Cochrane 9, from ProQuest 12 articles, and from Google Scholar is uh, 65 articles. After duplicates removed, we have 109 articles. And after assessment of title and abstract for eligibility, we have 20 articles. 
And after assessing for full text article eligibility, we have 13 articles. And after all, we, uh, we have five articles that included in this study. This is the five articles. The first is from Kaisinova et al. This is uh, the population is patient with PCS with other and outpatient treatment. This is a clinical trial. They, uh, there are two groups. Uh, the intervention is there are two groups. The first is 30 patients of group comparison that uh, prescribe mineral water, exercise therapy, home cocktails, and rectal suppositories. And the second is the main group is about uh, it, it is uh, it con consisted of 34 patients. This is uh, they use this uh, group psychotherapy combined with another therapy. So the outcome is uh, this, this stated that the main group have reduction of APNU about 29.4%, increase in adaptation capacity 42.4%, improvement of physical activity, and then normalization of hemodynamic parameters. After all, the main group uh, has 20 until 25% significantly better compared to the other group. Second study is from Code et al. This is RCT. This is RCT testing for the efficacy of ACDT. Uh, they name it as fit after COVID. This is a recovery trial. The intervention is 114 patients that will be randomized to either have fit after COVID or care as usual. The primary outcome is the major fatigue severity subscale from the before randomization directly positivity and at follow up six months and, after, and then 12 months after the second assessment. The secondary objective is uh, they determine the proportion of participants that no longer being severely fatigued at term one and term two. They also assess the physical and social functioning and the number of severity of somatic symptoms and in problems concentrating across term one and term two. But this study is still ongoing. The outcome will publish later. The third study is from the Fowler David at all. This is a systematic review which they search, but they have 40 papers. So the outcome is that they stated that long COVID management may be beneficial when a physical and psychological support is delivered in groups where people can plan their functional response to fatigue. And second, as they stated, their well strengthening rather than endurance is used to prevent the conditioning. And the third is where fatigue is regarded in the context of an individual lifestyle and home-based activities are used. The fourth study is from Heronwell et al. This is also a cohort study. This is a, a intervention. They, uh, they examined the 149 participants uh, that provided demographic information and completed baseline and pre course assessments. But only 76 participants completed the post course recovering from COVID assessment. They measured the health related quality of life across five dimensions, which is Problems with mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain and discomfort, and anxiety and depression. So the outcome is that frequency of improvement in overall head state is about 40, sorry, is about 53.9%, mobility is 46.1%, self-care is 21.6%, usual activities is 38.2%, pain and discomfort 59.5%, and anxiety and depression is 36.8%. The last study is from Bizarre et al. This is a systematic research. They said uh, they found that 43 articles. The outcome is that they stated that management strategies must be based on multidisciplinary approach of prevention access based on the systemic, systematic detection of psychiatric symptoms and early management, a pharmacological access that consists of antidepressant, psychotherapy, and innovative immunopsychiatric therapies treatments based on the redox balance and natural molecule structures of noise. So we know that for discussion that COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in the early reporting of the latter effects of the viral infection that can be characterized as a post-viral syndrome. People with PCS can experience a long term of chronic fatigue characterized by post exceptional exhaustion. It may be have a common etiology to chronic fatigue syndrome or myalgic encephalitis type fatigue but long COVID fatigue is coexist with another symptom such as shortness of breath and associated anxiety. From studies that concerning to PCS, they found that depression is varying from 30 until 40 percent, 
and symptoms of anxiety are also frequent, which mostly correspond to the NCS type of adjustment disorder criterion. Studies that focus on uh, PCS also stated that uh, they found that sleep disorders is reaching prevalence of 40%. The PTSD more than four weeks after the acute phase is about 10.9, sorry, 10.6% until 30%. Currently, the treatment options are limited because there are insufficient data, understanding mechanism, and the PCS. There are some etiological possibilities, first is because of viral persistence, second is because of autoimmune disease, and the third is because of persistent inflammatory factors. So, we, uh, we, we have to use multidisciplinary care because we can use a long-term monitoring for identifying complication, so we can, uh, we know we we can use a clinical intervention, the, uh, the need for physical rehabilitation, the need for mental health, and the need for social services support. From this future guideline, next guideline, they stated there are three principles for managing post-COVID syndrome. The first is self-management and supported self-management. The second is multidisciplinary rehabilitation, and the third is additional support. Psychotherapy is included in the multidisciplinary rehabilitation. Uh, study from Put at all. Uh, this is study that is stated as named as Speed After COVID. This is a CBT targeting several post infectious topic. This study is still ongoing. Uh, and the second study is uh, another study is Casino Fire All. They conduct a uh, group psychotherapy combined with other approaches. Uh, they found that therapy group outperformed control group by 20 until 25%. The follower deficit at all have also conducted this. They stated that PCS management may be beneficial when physical and psychological support is delivered in groups. In contrast, Spring and all stated that unlikely CBT will reduce disability or lead to objective improvement in PCS. Study from Heron 1 et al. They, they conducted a psychological led interdisciplinary virtual rehabilitation consisting of seven courses. Stress management is included in the CBT. It session lasted one hour, conducted every day. The result is for 59.3% uh, improvement in overall health, 36.8% in improvement in anxiety and depression. Uh, the online psychotherapy is effective in this pandemic era in dealing psychological complications in COVID-19 patients as stated by Satri et al. Bisaku et al. also stated that management strategies must be based on multidisciplinary approach. Our conclusion is that we can conclude that psychotherapy is effective in treating PCS combined with other approaches. Outcomes will be better if patients were treated as soon as possible and evaluation should be tailored to each person. Nonetheless, there needs to be further research on the optimal duration and session of psychotherapy in the treatment of PCS. Thank you. These are my friends. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank you, the committee of the SCTM, for giving me the opportunity to present my EBCR. My name is Dika Iona Sinulinga. I am from Medan, North Sumatra, Indonesia. Thank you very much, Dr. Dika. And uh, <coughs> Next report, Dr. Abdullah and co-authors. Association between depression, anxiety, and stress symptom and glycemic control in type 2 diabetes mellitus. Patients at a pension clinic, Sionel ABD General Hospital, Banga Age. Welcome to the 19th Congress of the Asian College of Psychosomatic Medicine. Let me introduce myself. My name is Putra Hidayat from Psychosomatic and Palliative Division, Department of Internal Medicine Specialty Education Programs, Universitas Indonesia in Jakarta, Indonesia. Today, me and my senior and my teacher, Dr. Hamza Shatri, Dr. Rudi Putranto, and Dr. Edward Faisal, 
would like to present our evidence-based case report about one of pain treatment as palliative management of patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay, uh, let me share my slide first. So this is the title, Pain Palliation by Celiac Plexus Neurolysis in Hepatocellular Carcinoma Related Abdominal Pain and Evidence-Based Case Report. Hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC, remains the most common primary liver malignancy in the world. It is the third leading cause of cancer-related mortality, and abdominal pain is one of the most commonly reported symptoms. Furthermore, HCC usually arise from cirrhotic patients, and this poses as clinical challenge in using traditional analgesics in this population. In hepatic patients, elimination and metabolism of most analgesic, including paracetamol, NSAID, and also opioids can be impaired. As a result, the drugs will accumulate and adverse effects may increase. On the contrary, drugs themselves can also cause liver dysfunction. Many drugs, including analgesics, can cause liver injury. This is several suggested modifications for various analgesics in cirrhosis. Even with mentioned analgesics above, pain relief might not be achieved and HCC patients come to emergency unit presenting as an intractable abdominal pain. On the other hand, celiac plexus is a sympathetic plexus which supplies the upper abdominal organ into the liver. Celiac plexus neurolysis or CPN is procedured to improve pain control by injecting absolute alcohol into the celiac plexus neural network of ganglia. This is the celiac network ganglia as the picture on the right side. There are linked studies concerning CPN in HCC related patients, but many studies uh, we can find that, uh, that assess the use of CPN in pancreatic cancer management. This EBCR will evaluate the efficacy of CPN to improve pain in patients with HCC. This is a brief review of CPN. There are two approaches, percutaneous approach from the left picture and endoscopic ultrasound approach uh, from the right picture. As the case illustration, a 38-year-old man present to the hospital with the complaint of the abdominal pain for the past six months. He also had significant weight loss for the past three months and from physical examination, it revealed hepatomegaly, acetes, and also epithelia. From the biochemical parameters, it revealed the increased value of liver function test with a value of 200 and 400 international units. And the serological finding, we found hepatitis B was positive, and the alpha fatty protein was markedly elevated with a value of 34,000. Later in this CT scan, it revealed a mass with characteristic of hepatocellular carcinoma. So for the clinical question, what is the efficacy of celiac plexus neurolysis in patients with ACC-related abdominal pain? As the population is the patients with ACC-related abdominal pain, intervention is celiac plexus neurolysis. Comparison is standard pain management or patients with no intervention. And the outcome is the presence or the absence or the reduction of pain itself. We use five online database and for the keywords, these are the keywords that we use, neurolysis or celiac plexus neurolysis and hepatocellular carcinoma or primary liver cancer and abdominal pain or cancer pain. And then after identification, screening, and also LGBT testing, we include three studies in this EBCR. This is the summary. For the first study uh, from uh, three studies, the first is by Tadros et al. 2017, include 21 adult patients with abdominal pain due to upper abdominal cancer, including HCC. The determinant is LCPN without comparison, and the outcome is pain measured by visual analog scale. For al 2019, this is the second study. They include 30 patients with advanced HCC with moderate to severe abdominal pain, and the intervention is LCPN without comparisons, and the outcome is the pain measured by numeric tapping scale. For the last study by Gofar et al. 2019, they include 50 patients. Uh, the intervention is LCPN with bufifacain. For the comparison, LCPN with bufifacain with the addition of dexmedetomidine, and the outcome is the pain measured by numeric tapping scale. This is the clinical appraisal for the first two, two studies. 
the first two study uh, doesn't have a comparison. So this is the match uh, critical appraisal form that I use. So for both study, the question and the objective is clearly stated. The eligibility and selection criteria is clearly specified and also described. And the participant in the study is representative. Unfortunately, the sample size is uh, not sufficiently large enough to provide confidence in the findings. And then for the outcome, uh, it measures uh, clearly defined, valid, and also reliable. Uh, and then for the outcome measures, uh, it's taken multiple times before the intervention and taken also multiple times after the intervention. So for the overall quality for these two studies is good. And then for the last studies, I use this uh, form for before and after study with control by GoFar et al. 2019 for the overall quality is the first uh, quality. This is the first study. Okay, this is the study by al uh, They use uh, AUCPN in HCC related abdominal pain with uh, the total of 30 patients. This is the, the method they use. We can see here that they insert the endoscopic ultrasound, and then after they reach the gastric uh, corpus, uh, they will try to search the celiac plexus network, and they have three approach. The two blue arrows here uh, is the sideway approach, and the red arrow here is the midline approach to inject the uh, analgesis into the celiac plexus uh, network. And as the results, uh, they have 30 patients with 24 men and 6 women. The mean age is 61 years old. And the symptoms appeared is acetes, jaundice, and also history of upper GI bleeding. 60% patients have BCLCC, 40% patients have BCLCD. This is because pain itself affects the performance of this. And after one to two weeks following treatment, 21 patients had reduction in pain by more than 50%. Two patients had reduction in pain by 30 to 50%, but seven patients had a pain reduction less than 30% in which four of them had no response at all. In this study, we can see that older patients also had more pain reduction than younger patients. This is the overall pain reduction score. And the pain score remained low until 16 weeks after the procedure. For the second study, this is study by Tadros et al. They used a different approach. They used a percutaneous approach, CPN, for the patients. This is the approach. They use paramedian and also midline linear alpha medians to inject uh, analgesics into the celiac plexus uh, network. As the result, uh, they include several upper uh, abdominal uh, cancer. And HCC is the most frequent cause of abdominal pain compared to pancreatic carcinoma, lymphoma, or gallbladder adenocarcinoma. And from 21 patients, only one case failed for the CPN procedure. This is the change of fast score. We can see marked decrease in pain severity in all patients in day one after CPN. And after that, uh, the fast score or the pain score is relatively low and stationary for the course of three months. For analgesic drug consumption, it decreased significantly for three months. After one week, all patients stop opioids and three patients continue on NSAIDs. After three months, eight patients continue on NSAIDs and only three patients took opioids with lesser dose. For complication, uh, no major complication occurred and observed in this study. For the third study, we can see here this is a bit different because they try to assess the additive value of dexmedetomidine for IOS guided CPN. So 50 patients, mean age of 60 years, divided into two groups. The first group, the blue one, is the patients with uh, the AOCPN procedure uh, alone. And for the second one, the red line is the group of patients with AOCPN with additional uh, substance, uh, which is uh, dexmedetomidin. We can see here that the pain reduction score is uh, lower here, and it is better for the second group than the group that has AOCPN and uh, dexmedetomidin added. As the discussion, CPN is the interventional technique. 
for treatment of abdominal visceral pain from upper abdominal cancer in GI malignancy. And also, uh, all systemic analgesics, opioid, non-opioid, may fail to provide adequate control. And CPM here can be employed for pain originating from pancreas, upper GI malignancy, including liver. From the study by Arbat, the fact that all patients are either stage C or D is because their performance status is affected by pain. Uh, in this study, older patients also had more pain reduction than younger patients. They have fewer daily activities, so they subjectively feel more pain reduction. Not all patients had optimal response to CPN. This is uh, maybe uh, caused by partial destruction of nerve fibers in cellular plexus. Uh, and also for the median pain score, it was 3 at week 2, which was significantly lower than pre endoscopic median pain score, which is 9. From the second study, uh, Tadgers et al. used different approach, which is percutaneous ultrasound guided CPN. They conclude that US guided CPN is simple, inexpensive, and effective, but it has also several disadvantages, including that ultrasound is not able to display as clearly as CT scan and also it is very operator-dependent procedure. In their study, US-guided CPN was done with injection of 50% uh, ethanol, and uh, there was good pain relief for three months for all patients. For the last studies, uh, Gofar uh, et al., they recommend AUCPN as an adjunct method to standard pain treatment. The residual post neurolysis pain may be related to non visceral pain due to tumor infection to muscles or surrounding connective tissue and factors related to the technique and timing. In this study, no statistically significant difference between the two groups has reduced the degree of pain till the first week, the first four weeks after the procedure. This suggests that a good sustained pain relief achieved in group two may be related to addition of dexmedetomidine. The mechanism of dexmedetomidine itself uh, may have not been fully elucidated, but a physiologic prominent action of alpha to adrenal receptor is the reduction of calcium conductance into cell that inhibit the neurotransmitter release. As conclusion, percutaneous CPN or LCPN both appears to be effective and a safe way to palliative pain management in patients with advanced ACC. It should be a potential choice in patients with moderate to severe abdominal pain as they are not considered for therapeutic intervention. The additional of edx to bupivacaine in LCPN also demonstrate a beneficial effect. And further evaluation of larger groups of patients in multi-center studies is required to evaluate this procedure as routine therapeutic approach. I think that's all about my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Welcome to the 19th Congress, the Asian College of Psychosomatic Medicine. Let me introduce myself. My name is Putra Hidayat from Psychosomatic and Palliative Division, Department of Internal Medicine Specialty Education Programs, Universitas Indonesia in Jakarta, Indonesia. Today, me and my senior and my teacher, Dr. Hamza Shatri, Dr. Rudi Putranto, and Dr. Edward Faisal, would like to present our evidence-based case report about one of pain treatment as palliative management of patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay, uh, let me share my slide first. So this is the title, Pain Palliation by Celiac Plexus Neurolysis in Hepatocellular Carcinoma Related Abdominal Pain and Evidence-Based Case Report. Hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC, remains the most common primary liver malignancy in the world it is the third leading cause of cancer-related mortality, and abdominal pain is one of the most commonly reported symptoms. Furthermore, HCC usually arises from cirrhotic patients, and this poses as clinical challenge in using traditional analgesics in this population. In hepatic patients, elimination and metabolism of most analgesic, including paracetamol, NSAID, and also opioids can be impaired. As a result, the drugs will accumulate and adverse effects may increase. On the contrary, drugs themselves can also cause liver dysfunction. Many drugs, including analgesics, can cause liver injury. This is several suggested modifications for various analgesics in cirrhosis. Even with mentioned analgesics above, pain relief might not be achieved and HCC patients come to emergency unit 
presenting as an intractable abdominal pain. On the other hand, celiac plexus is a sympathetic plexus which supply the upper abdominal organ into the liver. Celiac plexus neurolysis or CPN is procedured to improve pain control by injecting absolute alcohol into the celiac plexus neural network of ganglia. This is the celiac network ganglia as the picture on the right side. There are limited studies concerning CPN in HCC related patients, but many studies uh, we can find that, uh, that assess the use of CPN in pancreatic. This from PTSD, the most common alternative or comorbid diagnosis. All providers must recognize that when bipolarity is missed, antidepressant prescription often follows. Antidepressants can induce bipolar mixed states with impulsivity and suicidality. In our, in our experience with the collaborative care model suggests that the most actual disorder other than bipolar disorder which determines treatment are personality disorder, especially cluster B. According to ADSS algorithm, the first line drugs to treat depression are estalopram and sertraline prescribed at an effective dose long enough. Second line mirtazapine in the absence of overweight and diabetes and vortoxetin. Now project screening tools must exclude bipolar disorder and severe forms of personality disorder. Any condition associated with high suicide risk of the pharmacological treatment according to the ADSS algorithm. Psychoeducation and psychotherapy is provided with the use of digital technology. Digital technologies can deliver depression treatment as standalone interventions and can support clinical decision making. Contemporary clinical decision-making models emphasize shared decision-making throughout the course of treatment, which is associated with better clinical outcomes. Measurement-based care for depression refers to the systematic administration score and review of depression rating scales to inform decision-making. Mobile devices and wearable biosensors have the capacity to expand uh, the quantity, quality, and accuracy of data by capturing data passively, requiring minimal effort from the patient. Smartphones also have the capacity to collect self-reported symptom ratings. Tools that support this form of self-monitoring may themselves provide therapeutic benefit by helping patients understand their symptoms better. Effective Patient provider and provider provider communication are essential to the provision of integrated care. Technology that support communication with treatment providers outside of clinical sessions may promote patient engagement even if communication are limited to questionnaires. Research suggests that individual patient characteristics can predict responses to different treatments. However, developing more personalized treatments will likely require big data on clinical outcomes across large combination treatment approaches crossed with the multitude of biomedical, behavioral and environmental characteristics that could predict responses to the treatments. Smartphones are providing a plethora of data enabling new insights into various conditions, often referred to as digital phenotyping, the multimodal nature of passive data obtaining automatically through the sensor from consumer-grade devices offers a means to understand the lived experiences of mental health in context. The depth and diversity of passive data require new techniques in data science such as uh, machine learning. Social media can be used as a therapeutic tool. Chatbot interfaces have become a key feature of many available mental health apps.
with ecological momentary assessment, participants complete assessment on their symptoms, affect thoughts, activities, and contacts several times a day for a given period. EMA enables the study of the impact of contacts on affect and symptoms, which likely plays an important role in the development and maintenance of mental disorders. The frequent and repeated nature of EMA is ideally suited to study how mental disorders develop and maintain it over time in daily life. Rather than assuming that symptoms arise from an underlying common cause, the network theory proposes that symptoms can trigger each other up to the point that the individual presents with the symptoms of full-blown mental disorder. It assumes that mental disorder originate from a process of spread activation in a symptom network. According to network theory, it might be expected that comorbidity of psychiatric disorder can be explained through the existence of breach symptoms that activate symptoms of both disorders. Research has examined whether a more connected network reflects increased vulnerability to psychopathology, also known as the connectivity vulnerability hypothesis. The empirical network study examined network association when people already experience symptoms. These micro-level cross-sectional studies may inform on the occurrence of symptoms in diverse psychiatric population. Micro-level approach studies the dynamic interaction between momentary states collected through EMA for one patient. Another promising way to utilize EMA data in personalized model can be derived from complex dynamic system theory. Complex dynamic system theory is interesting because of its potential to use EMA data to alert patients and their clinicians to impending transition in psychopathology, for example, a sudden increase in depressive symptoms. Such upcoming shifts might be anticipated by examining the dynamics of time series data. The interesting part about CDS theory is its potential to anticipate transition without a theoretical understanding of the system. Early warning signals based on EMA have the potential to be more sensitive to impending mood shifts, providing patients and their clinicians with an individual risk assessment of upcoming episodes and enable early intervention before a full-blown episode is developed. In our project, we use the following tools for screening, assessment and psychoeducation at the same time. Google form based on clinical scales PHQ, GAD, BPQ. The results presented in Google Sheets are also displayed on clinician-friendly dashboard using automation tools. Diagnostic and psychoeducational chatbot based on the mini international neuropsychiatric interview and workbooks for patients with mental disorder. Telegram chatbot and web application we use to implement ecological momentary assessment and behavioral therapy, the main component of which are shown on this slide. Ecological momentary assessment includes questions about the current emotional state, anxiety, depression, irritation, and context. The web app includes a user dashboard for EMA and behavioral activation and exposure therapy model. This slide shows screenshots of the web application. Patients also have the option to use a native mobile app for behavioral activation for Android smartphone. This slide shows screenshot of the native mobile app. Results of the analysis using the methods described above. The clinical group of outpatient with affective spectrum disorder after screening and excluding patient with evidence of psychotic disorder, secondary disorders, bipolar disorder, depression and personality disorder associated with recurrent self-harm and high suicide risk, including three subgroups. The first group 
101 patients uh, was characterized by relatively younger age, a predominance of female with a mild to moderate depressive episode and anxiety or somatoform disorder and mixed pers personality disorder. The second group, 91 patients, uh, included a relatively older patient with a depressive episode of mild to moderate se severity and possibly with an anxiety or somatoform disorder. The third group, 52 patients uh, with adjustment disorder. Scores on the depression, anxiety and PBQ scales were significantly higher in the first group, depression, anxiety and personality disorders, according to the Mann Whitney test. The second group, depression and anxiety disorders, had significantly higher scores on the depression, anxiety scales than the third group, adjustment disorder. The slide shows the result of the network analysis. Figure 1 demonstrates a fairly tight relationship between anxiety and depression symptoms, as well as the relationship between sad mood and personal beliefs of dependency in the first group. It was mentioned above that studies have shown that more connected network reflects increased vulnerability to psychopathology. Figure 2 demonstrates the relationship of symptoms of depression, anxiety and dysfunctional personality beliefs in second group, depression and possible anxiety disorders. Anxiety and depressive symptoms are linked through motor symptoms like bridge symptoms and are isolated from dysfunctional beliefs. Figure 3 shows the relationship of symptoms and dysfunctional beliefs in the third group. In adjustment disorder, sad mood is associated with irritability. Suicidal ideation with dysfunctional beliefs of distrust and protection. Critical transition between stable states in a complex system are preceded by a critical fluctuation that can be identified as increased variability and complexity in the system's behavior over time. Critical fluctuation thus serve as the early warning signal for such transitions. The main purpose of the following vignettes is to showcase the dynamic complex complexity functions family in CASNET package for R with e EMA data. The function TS levels as a method to identify possible transitions. We can use the function TS levels to evaluate whether there are regime shifts in the data. The SWIN is used to calculate dynamic complexity. We can aggregate the dynamic complexity values of multiple items. For multiple variables, in which case we can produce a complexity resonance diagram. Here we can see example 2 and 3. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Hi, you guys. Uh, I am Anders from Guangzhou Panji Central Hospital. I'm glad that I can have a chance to introduce myself and uh, our project in front of you of guys. And our project's name is Shref Visionism, Emergency Competency and respond to public emergency among nurses in South China. First one, I want to uh, show the contents of how I will introduce for you guys. The first one is the background and the address. The second one is material and methods. The third one is result and discussion. And the last one is conclusion. So at the first one is the background of our object. As we know, in recent years, public health emergency have become increasingly serious according to the statistics of the World Health Organization. We all know the 1,200 1, infections disease in this occurred in 168 countries from 2012 to 2017, such as SARS, H1N1 influence, and the coronavirus, all pose a great threat to human health. And what occurred on nurses? This is the picture that taken in our hospital. They are uh, fighting to the coronavirus. 
Maybe the infection disease, the nurse needs to respond to the patient as soon as possible. They are the first one to respond to the emergency. So I, our team want to explore the preserved strength with this emergency competency and respond to the proper emergency among the nurse. We based on the theory uh, of the laser and foam mag. So the part two is the material and, and the way. Uh, we all, uh, a total of 16 and 46 nurses from the hospital in South China. And we let them to respond the self-report questionnaire for a website just like the uh, website of the pictures. And there's, uh, we let them to fill up in four questionnaires. The first one is the calm capacity of the nurses in public emergency. This is the questionnaire which which is exposed out by our team because we cannot find a great um, a measure to measure the cone capacity in the proper emergency. So we find these items uh, throughout expert interviews and literature interviews. It's based on uh, uh, 40, uh, 51 items and after the inspection, the cone ever confidence of the questionnaire is 0 0.992 so it has a effective uh, way for us to measure the coin capacity and the second one is preserved stress scale from 10 and it is um uh, evalu evaluates the stress level for individual in the last month and the third one is uh, the 10 items uh corner with only some scale the scale is is brought by a chinese guy uh his uh doctor yeah i feel thankful for him because he gave up a chance to me measure the scale uh after his uh approve and the and the next one scale is simple comping styles this style is um Combined by Xie Yan Yin, which is divided, active coping style and alimentations. And the last one is the data analyzed was by T test and one one way alone for different between groups and analyzed the main influence factor for con emergency by SPSS 25.1. And the then the third part is the result and discussions and the first from this we can see the general information of the search subject and the different uh cone of the scale and the second one is the correlation among the main variables we can see the uh, boss the table two uh, the main our variable is um is uh, have a strong uh collaboration uh, between emergency competency positive coping and negative coping but we can find preserved strength maybe it's maybe not uh have a good collaboration between the other three main variables so i think it is um interesting is for for our study that means um maybe the nurse are uh, adapt to this um emergency com competency because uh coronavirus are uh, uh, maybe throughout for two, more than two years they are adapted to it i think it is uh interesting is for for our work and the third one is multiple nire with gradient analyze we can see the table three. We can find that um, uh, some uh, influence factors such as uh, the the working years, the participant in the frightened of the infectious disease or not. 
is maybe uh, explain the 32.3% of the range of the emergency competency. This may be um, as uh, normal that uh, the working girls, maybe they have a good training or maybe they have a good adapt to the emergency and they may be on a more the emergency competency and if they have also also that if they had um, participate in the treatment of infection disease they can get more experience from this so we get this a result from the uh, from our project and the fourth one is uh, the conclusion of our project first we find in this study is suggests that with solism and positive coping predict higher score of the emergency competency when nurse facing the proper emergency in the stressful condition and it is important that intervention need to be adapted to strengthen the visualism and its more effective training method to improve their way for coping with the different from enhance the emergency competency. Okay, uh, this is the uh, reference of our work, this project, maybe apart from it. And uh, I also thankful for you guys to listen for me. Maybe um, a little bit a uh, shortage of our presentation, and I hope uh, we can continue to focus the visualism and the stressful for nurses. Thank you, you guys. Bye. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, unfortunately, some uh, speakers were unable to connect and the program of our session has uh, changed. Now uh, I want to present you my uh, presentation, uh, depressive disorder with somatization symptoms. Uh, um, uh, some words about um, me. I'm a head of psychiatry and narcology department of Irkutsk State Medical Academy of uh, uh, Postgraduated Education. Uh, I can't change my slide. Uh, Um, somatization is well known uh, a tendency to experience and communicate somatic distress in response to uh, psychosocial stress and uh, to seek medical help for it poses a major medical, social, and economic problem. It's most often associated with depressive and anxiety disorders and constitutes uh, the core of somatoform disorders. Uh, Lipovsky uh, distinguished uh, three main uh, components of somatization, sensory, cognitive, and behavioral. Um, other authors... Uh, Sorry. Other authors, as uh, Kemeir and Robbins, uh, identified three forms of somatization. The first, high levels of functional somatic distress. The second, hypochondriasis with illness vary in the absence of evidence for serious illness. And the third, exclusively somatic clinical presentation among patients with a current major depression and anxiety. 
according to the literature, somatization psychopathological disorders oh, are represented by pathological sensation, algae, sinister algae, sinister pati and others, uh, somata vegetative disorders and high stereo uh, conversion symptoms. According to Glatzel research, bodily sensation can be divided into two types. Homonomic bodily sensation reveal a phenomenological similarity to the sensation caused by real-life somatic pathology. And heteronomic bodily sensation are of an unusual nature, devoid of phenomenological similarity with sensation caused by a real-life somatic pathology. Uh, nowadays, uh, in ICD-10, depression, anxiety, and somatization uh, are posted under different uh, headings. The overlap of somatization, depression, and anxiety symptoms uh, constitutes a triple problem. The need to develop diagnostic criteria for somatization affective disorders uh, was discussed some years ago. In a recent work of our department, we studied the integrative estimation of depression, anxiety, and somatoform disorders. Uh, in our past uh, research, we uh, single out four component structure of somatization disorder. Uh, sensory component uh, was uh, introduced by LG, synestalgia, and synestopathy. Uh, vegetative uh, component uh, uh, was introduced uh, by different uh, complaints uh, in descending order of frequency, palpitation, dizziness, nausea, uh, sweating, uh, shortness of breath, hot or cold flashes. Effective uh, component uh, was uh, introduced uh, uh, as uh, mild, moderate, or severe depressive episode, and most patients had an anxious type of depression, 84%, uh, less often melancholy anxious uh, type of depression. Ideatory uh, component uh, was uh, anxious thoughts, uh, hypochondrical or non-hypochondric uh, content. Uh, the aim of our research was a clinical analysis of somatization symptoms of monopolar uh, depressive disorder in the aspect of psychopathology, patterns of formation, dynamics, and therapy. Uh, the research object was depressive disorder as part of a monopolar variant of affective psychosis with the manifestation of the disease at the age of 25-55 years. Diagnosis of depressive disorder and determination of severity were carried out in accordance with the ICD-10 criteria. Exclusion criteria. Persons with a history or current mental status of the ICD-10 criteria for the diagnosis of mania or hypomania, organic mental disorders, mental and behavioral disorders due to psychoactive substance use, schizophrenia, schizotypal and delusional disorder, mental retardation or severe somatic pathology. Uh, as research methods, uh, we uh, used uh, psychometric assessment, uh, Gamilton depression rating scale, Gamilton anxiety rating scale, and clinical global impression scale. And of course, we used uh, statistical processing. 
uh, as drug therapy we uh, used monotherapy uh, with antidepressants uh, from different uh, groups uh, uh, SSRIs, paroxetine, sertraline, escitalopram, uh, SNRI, venlafaxin, melatoninergic uh, and uh, tricycle antidepressants. Uh, as uh, augmentation drugs, we used benzodiazepine, uh, atypical uh, and so-called small antipsychotics. Therapeutic efficacy was assessed by the number of respondents with a reduction in gamelton depression rating scale scores of 50% uh, or more during therapy. Uh, the results of our research. Uh, taking into account somatization symptoms, we identified four groups uh, of patients. Uh, the first group uh, with depressive episode, the second group depressive episode with somata vegetative disorders, the third group depressive episode with homonomous pathological bodily sensation, and the fourth group depressive episode with heteronomous pathological bodily sensation. Uh, in the first group with depressive uh, episode, the somatization symptoms were represented by the vitalization of uh, melancholia uh, effect in 28.7% uh, and vitalization of anxiety effect in 14.9%. Uh, In the second group, uh, depressive episode with somatovegetative disorders, somatization symptoms uh, uh, were different uh, and uh, uh, most often uh, have complaints uh, to uh, sweating, tachycardia, hot flashes or cold chills, dizziness, dry mouth, uh, difficulty breathing, nausea, diarrhea or abdominal distress, and less often a cessation of a lump in the throat or difficulty with swallowing or frequent urination. In the third group uh, with a depressive episode and a homonomous pathological bodily sensation, somatization symptoms uh, have uh, algae uh, with different localization, uh, most often head, thorax, abdomen, uh, limbs, back, uh, less often neck or small pelvis. In the fourth group, uh, depressive episode with heteronomous pathological bodily sensation, uh, the somatization symptoms were uh, represented by monolocal, bilocal, or polylocal synestalgia, 83.3% uh, or synestopathy, 53.2%. Uh, the results of our study allow to conclude that uh, somatization symptoms in depressive disorder can be considered uh, as uh, uh, depressive somatization in the first group with depressive um, episode, in the second group uh, depressive episode with uh, somatovegetative disorders as anxious somatization, and uh, uh, in the uh, third group, depressive episode with gamonomic pathological bodily sensation as neurotic somatization, and the fourth group, depressive episode with heteronomous pathological bodily sensation as hypochondrical somatization. Uh, determination of respondents number during the treatment of depressive disorder uh, led 
to the conclusion that in patients of the first group with depressive episode, uh, the prescription of SSRIs antidepressants was effective. Uh, in the case of depressive episode and uh, somatovegetative disorders, a combination of an um, antidepressants SSRIs and anxiolytics uh, was uh, required. In the treatment of depression with gamanomas body sensation, a combination of uh, antidepressants uh, of various group with uh, antipsychotic, uh, uh, atypical antipsychotic or so-called small antipsychotic was effective. And uh, the fourth group uh, uh, depressive episode with uh, uh, Gitteranomus pathological bodily sensation, uh, antidepress antidepressant uh, uh, from different group uh, and uh, atypical antipsychotic, uh, uh, this therapy was effective. And thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, and um, we will continue our session and uh, our next speaker uh, from China, Joalian Ho. Can we connect with this speaker? An investigation into the association between multilocal genetic profile scores, individual variability patterns of brain functional connectivity, and clinical features in major depressive disorders. Please, you are welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to make this presentation. I'm Zhu Liang Hao from Zhongda Hospital affiliated with Southeast University in Nanjing, China. Uh, the subject of my presentation is an investigation uh, into the association between multilocus genetic profile profile scores, individual variability patterns of brain functional connectivity and the clinical features in major depressive disorder. My presentation is in five parts. To begin with, I would like to introduce the background of our research. As we all know, MDD is one of the most common psychiatric disorder. It's high mobility and high recurrence rate resulting in a heavy burden on society. <laughs> However, the clinical manifestation of MDD are highly heterogeneous. According to DSM-5, hundreds of uh, symptom phenotypes clarified for a diagnosis of MDD. So the clinician agreement for its diseases was very low. Besides symptoms, significant heterogeneity also exists in age of onset, clinical severity, persistence, comorbidity, and the response to the therapy. It brings great difficulty in the maximum research, diagnosis, and treatment. Therefore, it's necessary to further investigate individual differences in MDD patients. Uh, resting state functional MRI has been widely used to investigate the neural mechanisms of brain dysfunctions. MDD is recognized as a disorder of dysregulated neural networks. However, there are many inconsistencies in MDD research. Most previous FC studies used case control designs to uh, Assess group mean disease uh, to assess group mean 
differences between groups, largely ignoring inter-individual differences in FC among MDD patients. Uh, individual availability of functional connectivity LFC can identify the individual variability of brain function from imaging level and then reflect the individual variability of clinical phenotypes. Uh, here's the formula for it. Um, previous study of LFC found that in general population, LFC was heterogeneous across the cortex. High IVFC was in the association cortex over the adult lifespan, whereas IVFC in primary cortex was lower in the initial stage but increased with age. Uh, only one research involved IVFC patterns of MDD. Swain and colleagues mainly focused on the uh, Schizophrenia's FFC part and compared it with MDD and uh, bipolar disorder patients. They reported that the whole brain part of FFC MDD is similar to that of healthy people, and the brain region with significant differences are mainly located in vessel cortex. They didn't conduct further systematic study on MDD. Uh, due to the moderate heritability of MDD, the heterogeneity of MDD patients may partly come from genetic heterogeneity. Uh, DA pathway, serotonin pathway, NE pathway, HPA access, and uh, synaptic plasticity are closely related to the MDD pathogeny. Previous study focused on the relationship between cumulative risk of variations of these pathways measured by MGPS and found the genetic risk in pathways may influence clinical manifestations by influence brain function. Until now, uh, researchers have not treated MDD's IVFC patterns in much detail. Previous studies have not dealt with the influence of genetic factors on IVFC pattern in MDD patients. Uh, the relationship between IVFC and the heterogeneity of clinical manifestations of MDD patients has not been fully explored. Uh, this study helps to understand the high clinical heterogeneity of MDD and uh, has improved, has important application for individualized clinical diagnosis and treatment of MDD. Uh, the specific objective of this study was to first investigate the changes of FFC pattern in MDD patients from both level of brain regions and networks and analyze the key functional connectivities contribute to, the, to this change. Second, explore the main effects and interactions of genetic risk of bypass waste in IVFC pattern of MDD. Third, explore the correlation between IVFC and the clinical char characteristics of MDD patients. Finally, investigate whether changes in MDD mediated the influence of genetic risk of MDD on clinical char characteristics. And next, I will give a brief introduce to the research methods. Um, participants were enrolled from two hospitals and surrounding communities. The inclusion and exclusion uh, criteria were shown here. Uh, we collected basic information, HMD24 scores, MR data, and uh, gene sequencing data. Then clinical efficacy IVC pattern and the genetic risk were calculated. Uh, we prefer non-parametric permutation test, multiple linear regression, um, partial correlation analysis, and mediation effects analysis for statistics. Now I'd like to turn to result part. 
112 MDD patients and 93 HC subjects were include, included. Uh, the IVFC patterns of MDD group and HC group are analyzed based on two templates, the AAL outlines and the dozen bags template. Both of them show that the FNC pattern of MDD group was similar but higher than that in HC group. At the level of green networks, we found that IVFC in MDD group was significantly higher in all six functional brain networks. Uh, then we compare the differences of IVFC between groups, analysis based on dozen backs template from that MDD group had increased IVFC in 33 brain regions of six brain networks and no regions in MDD group showed a significantly lower FSC. Unfortunately, no significant differences were found by analysis based on the AAL template. Then we further explore the critical connections that contributed to increased IVFC in MDD. Most of them were inter-network FC. They were mainly distributed between default mode network and other networks. Next, we examine the influence of genetic pathways on IVFC in MDD. Genetic data from 112 MDD patients and 62 HC were calculated. No significant differences were found in total MGPS or MGPS of each pathway. And the interaction between MDD and the total genetic effects showed a positive correlation with MDD in the supplementary motor area. Analysis of single genetic pathway shows that the interaction between serotonin and PGS and MDD was positively correlated with IVFC in uh, ventral frontal cortex. The interaction effects between MDD and the HPA MGPS were observed in SMA as well as the interaction between MDD and NE MGPS. Further analysis of multiple pathways shows that the interaction of MDD, HPA MGPS, and NE MGPS affected the SMA. Uh, then we explored the association between clinical variables and IVFC and found the IVFC value of MDD was positively correlated with the course of disease and the age of onset and negatively correlated with severity of depression. Uh, in addition, IVFC in these regions was positively correlated with the two-week antidepressant efficacy and uh, the IVFC in the left basal ganglia was negatively correlated with the eight-week antidepressant efficacy. Mediation effects analysis relates that the IVFC value of the left VMPFC mediated the effects of genetic risk of serotonin pathway on the severity of depression. Uh, to summarize, the evasive part of MDD was similar but higher than HC group. Inter-network connectivity between DMN and other networks contributed to the increased FFC in MDD. Um, so tone NE HPA pathway gene affected FFC in MDD patients. Clinical variables including age of onset, duration, severity, and treatment response were correlated with the IVFC. Uh, IVFC had a mediating effects between genetic risk and uh, manifestation. In this study, IVFC part at both level of brain regions and networks in MDD patients were systematically studied for the first time. We firstly focus on the relationship between genetic risk and the uh, heterogeneity of brain function and the clinical features. It will be helpful to find neuroimaging markers of MDD promoting the study of genetic 
mechanisms and individualized diagnosis and the treatment of MDD. Uh, still, there are some limitations. The sample size was small and unequal between group. The samples were all adult without adolescent MDD patients. The environmental factor were not taken into account. The heterogeneity of FC also came from different in locations of functional areas across individual. Uh, individual differences in genetic background might influence treatment outcomes in MDD patients. Uh, these questions could be explored in future research. Uh, uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, now, uh, Dr. Abdullah can connect uh, and uh, let listen uh, report uh, which we have already done. province of uh, Indonesia. Patan uh, is uh, on the uh, Sumatra Island. Now, uh, I'll, this is the ho uh, hospital, uh, Jaino Abidin General Hospital, Aceh province, that uh, uh, the place that I, I did the study. Aceh is one of nine provinces of Indonesia that has most diabetes patients. It was about 417,600 uh, 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 patients or 8.7% of total of Achenic people. Now, uh, this is uh, the figure of interrelation of psychosocial factors and glycemic control. You know that behavioral changes lifestyle modification and self-management skill that influence the glycemic control. Objective uh, is to determine the relationship between symptoms of depression, anxiety, and stress with glycemic control of type 2 diabetes mellitus at outpatient clinic, Zeno Abidin General Hospital, Ganda Aceh. Method, this is an analytical cross-sectional study design. It was held in October until December 2019. The place was outpatient clinic Zaino Abidin General Hospital, Banda Aceh. The collecting data were about social demographic, lifestyle uh, and clinical characteristics, and that's 21 uh, questionnaire. And statistical analysis use uh, uh, T square test and Pister excess test. For uh, uh, inclusion criteria for uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus patients, it's uh, more than an 18 years old, had not been diagnosed as depression and anxiety, had agreement for follow the study, exclusion criteria work had not been able to answer the questionnaire, had psychopharmacotherapy, uh, history of psychological problems, and had severe clinical condition. The result is in, uh, we see that the table one about sociodemographic characteristic of patients. We, uh, we, we divide into two uh, classification of A1C as a glycemic control, less than 8% uh, percent and more than 8 uh, and more than an 8 percent uh, there is uh, there were uh, uh, 13 patient in less than 8 percent and more than uh, we have a thir uh, 13 and uh, 37 patients so for the age the mean and uh, standard deviation uh, means, uh, almost the same, about uh, 60 uh, years old. And uh, the classification of the age, uh, the domin dominate, dominate in uh, most of the, uh, more than 60 years old. 
about the gender, uh, it is uh, almost the same between uh, uh, male and a female. Uh, for the uh, maybe about uh, less, uh, uh, almost the same. Yeah, I think for male and female marriage. Uh, there is uh, uh, there was uh, all the participants or uh, or the patient are married. And uh, for education, I think it's about uh, a very, very uh, variation. And we can see it from the PFLO significance is uh, 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 less than 0 0.05. And uh, for profession, uh, housekeeper uh, dominate for the, uh, the of both of the group uh, of the group and the salary uh, in one month, maybe about uh, in this group, both of group is less than uh, three million. The minute our residents, residents, uh, they, uh, they were uh, 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 live uh, downtown, uh, dominate in this group, and there, there was they were uh, the, no smoking that we found uh, from the patient. For BMI, uh, overweight uh, dominant for the uh, both of group and duration of uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus more than 10 years, uh, most of them. There is no historical of uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus in patient and family and uh, Type of medicine is very uh, uh, variation that uh, we can see people do less uh, about almost uh, 0 0.05. And uh, table two about lifestyle and clinical characteristics of patient uh, for uh, microvascular complication. There most of them is hypertension and my. Uh, Micro, uh, macrovascular complication. There is no macrovascular complication most of them. And for uh, there is no uh, diabetic food. And duration of sleep uh, uh, about five hours for almost uh, most of the group. And this is the table three about the prevalence of depression, anxiety, and stress symptoms based on glycemic control value. Then we can see uh, of the uh, group uh, depression and uh, stress that dominate about normal and mild moderate. Uh, we see that uh, this uh, this is uh, significant reform in depression and stress with uh, the mild, uh, the classification of the patients, uh, mild, moderate, and normal, and also for stress and mild, moderate, and normal, but it's not uh, uh, for the anxiety, it's not significant. For table four, about uh, auto ratio value of depression, anxiety, and stress in terms based on clinical uh, uh, glycemic control value, so that here that uh, for depression and uh, stress, uh, mild moderate compared to normal, we can see that uh, out ratio 2.07, so uh, statistically uh, significant. For uh, stress, uh, that we see that uh, mild moderate compared to normal, uh, also significant and severe stress to normal is also significant. So for discussion, there were 50 type 2 diabetes mellitus patients in this study shows that uh, psychological symptoms, especially depression and stress, coexistence with type 2 diabetes mellitus. It is also found in the study of Carl et al. and Almawi et al. Zaid et al. said that severe depression patients with emotional stress has bad glycemic control, we found the same in the study. <clears throat> Depression, anxiety, and stress symptoms influence the glycemic control in type 2 diabetes mellitus patient, adult patient, clinic, Zeno Abidin Hospital. 
for limitation of study, does 21 questionnaire as a screening tool for Zaino Abidin, General Hospital, Banda Aceh. Thank you, Ms. Ong, for the opportunity for me to present my Thank you very much. Despite technical problems, uh, we are able to listen to your uh, report. Thank you very much. And our next speaker, uh, Bin Liu, advances in the study of compulsive sexual behavior disorder. Uh, please, you are welcome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Liu Bing, and I'm studying at Guzhou University. I'm glad to have the opportunity to take part in an oral report at the symposium. Mention of compulsive sexual behavior disorder. I believe your first reaction is, is it a disease? This disease is caused by frequent sexual behavior. This disorder is characterized by the patient's inability to control his or her frequent sexual behavior. CSBD is a controversial disease. Various terms have been used to name the condition, including nymphomania, psychosis, sexual impulsivity, out of control sexual behavior, <clears throat> sexual addiction, and hypersexual behavior. The WHO included CSBD as an impulse control disorder in the ICD-11. It is characterized by a persistent pattern of failure to control intense repetitive sexual impulses or urges resulting in repetitive sexual behavior over an extended period. That causes marked distress or impairment in person, family, social, educational, occupational, or other important areas of function. The pattern is manifest in one or more of the following. Engaging in repetitive sexual activities has become a central cause of the person's life to the point of neglecting health and the person's care of other interests, activities, and responsibilities. The person has made numerous unsuccessful efforts to control or significantly reduce repetitive sex sexual behavior. The person continues to engage in repetitive sexual behavior despite adverse consequences. The person continues to engage in repetitive sexual behavior even when she or her derive little or no satisfaction from it. However, substance addiction or physical illness that lead to symptoms similar to those of CSBD are not excluded in SAD-11. These symptoms are similar to CSBD and not due to direct physiological effects of exogenous substance or physiological disease. It has been found that taking small doses of opioids and clonopinia and traumatic brain injury can produce symptoms similar to those of CSBD. At present, due to the lack of uniform definitions and the diagnostic criteria and the inconsistent measurement tools used by various researchers, there are large data discrepancies among different studies. The prevalence of CSBD is 8.6%. The prevalence in men is between 4.2 and 10.3%. And the prevalence in women is between 0 and 7%. All studies point to significant gender variabilities in the prevalence of CSBD. So why this result? Consider that it may be that men have a higher frequency of using cyber sex and a higher craving for pornography than women, when both gender and sexual orientation was considered. LGBTQ males have a highest watch the most pornography viewing than any other group. Heterosexual women have the fewest sexual partner and masturbate and watch the less amount of pornography viewing. 
according to existing study. Mood disorder, anxiety disorders, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder are all common comorbidities of CSBD. Approximately 94% of the CSBD patients meet the criteria for at least one psychiatric disorder, and 57% of men meet the criteria for two or more psychiatric disorders. Another study found that CSBD participants so were more likely to report an increased prevalence of alcohol dependence, alcohol abuse, major depressive disorder, below mina nervosa, adjustment disorder, other substance abuse or dependence, and borderline personality disorders. Although frequent sexual behavior does not indicate CSBD, if excessive sexual activities or fantasy is considered a risk factor for the, the disease, then males may be the group most at risk of engaging in CSBD. In addition, college students have a higher prevalence rate than community residents. Therefore, in the future, more variables such as age, occupation, marital and pregnancy history should be included in addition to sex to investigate the relationship between these variables and the prevalence. So, and at this time, we have a question. How does CSBD develop? Here are two models. The first model supports the conceptualization of CSBD as a compulsive impulsive disorder. A, a substantive number of OCD patients and the impulsive control disorder patients suffer from CSBD. This indicates that two diseases have a similar physiological and psychological process. It is the impulsive component that initiates the cycle, and then compulsive seeking leads to repetitive and frequent behavior. The second is the addiction model. A model study patient with a Parkinson's disease knew one said compulsive gambling, and the CSBD was documented in patients taking therapeutic doses of dopamine dob agonists. This fact supports that CSBD is a behaviorally induced addiction. Over 17% of patients with CSBD experience withdrawal reactions such as nervousness, insomnia, sweating, nausea, rapid heartbeat, shortness of breath, and fatigue. According to the incentive sensitization theory of addiction, at its heart, Addiction is a disorder of aberrant incentive motivation due to addictive substance sensitization of the mesolimbic system, which causes a pathological incentive motivation for addictive substance. In addition to addictive drug, frequent sexual behavior can activate the mesolimbic system here and alert its function and morphology. SPD subject show greater left amygdala green matter volume and decreased function functional connectivity between the amygdala and the thus lateral prefrontal cortex converges with an individual with internet gaming disorder on the connectivity in this region. Exposure to sex sexually explicit cues in CSBD compared to no CSBD subject was associated with activation of the dorsal anterior cingulate, ventral striatum, and amygdala. This finding is similar to the response of a brain region in drug addicts when stimulated by addictive drug. If CSBD is an addiction disease, then sexual behavior affects the reward circuits in the brain so that greater stimulation is required to produce pleasure, and the patient suffers from the negative effects of excessive sexual behavior. So how to diagnose the, the disease? Currently, the commonly used skills are HBI, SASB, CSBI-13, CSBD-19. Although all of these skills are, have been used in CSBD studies, several problems have subsequently presented themselves. Different tools have different emphasis, and no comparative study is possible. The skills are all self-rating skills that will be influenced by objective factor of the subject. The result of the these skills can only be used as a reference. 
The diagonals of sex BD require the canonical to consider the objective frequency of sexual behavior. And the subjective pain and the damage caused will include excluding religious and moral influence. Therefore, the diagnosis of sex BD is difficult. The diagnosis of the disease requires not only the inclusion of the patient subjective factor, but also a comprehensive assessment and a diagnosis based on the measurement results by the clinical without any person bias. How should we treat this disease? Many individuals with CSBD seek treatment in free self-support group based on the 20-step program. And the medication has selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, gonadotropin release hormone, antiandrogen, or POA receptor antagonists. Studies has found that WHD levels are decreased and the dopamine levels are, are increased in patients with CSBD. Taking an SSRI produces too much WHD, which acts on the central nervous system and leads to decreased in libido and other impairment in sexual function. Some studies have confirmed that Cetapro and Fluxtin can reduce the symptoms of CSBD in men. Gonadotropin releasing hormone is a neural hormone produced by the hypothalamus and plays an important role in the regulation of reproduction. It reduces the testosterone levels by inhibiting the synthesis of luteinized hormone, which helps reduce libido. Troubling works by inhibiting steroid production in the ovaries and the testes, and taking this medication for three to ten months can reduce male sexual fantasies. Antiandrogen can significantly reduce testosterone level, leading to impaired sexual function and decreased libido. Majoxy progesterone acetate and ciprotrol acetate are effective in re reducing libido and are not used in the treatment of paraphilia. Opioid receptor antagonists have a blocking effect on all types of opioid receptors uh, and are commonly used in clinical detoxification and the prevention of alcohol dependence. A study of 20 men with CSBD who received a four week of nutrition, 25, four, uh, 50 MG found that nutrition is feasible and tolerable and may reduce the symptom of CSBD by affecting the reward pathway of mid-brain dopamine. Nutrition reduces the patient's libido and enables the patient to consciously control the frequency of sexual behavior. Although the etiology and the pathological mechanism of CSBD is unclear, the, a disorder that meets the diagnostic criteria for CSBD in SAD11 does exist. The distress caused by CSBD may lead to depression, anxiety, drug, drug abuse, suicide. So it needs more attention. In addition, patients with CSBD may have casual sex, sex or multiple sexual partner, increase the risk of contracting STDs. It can be seen that timely diagnosis and treatment of this group are very necessary. Effective treatment methods for CSBD need to be further explored. On the one hand, in the future research, long-term randomized controlled drug experiment with large sample can be used. On the other hand, research on the effects of CSBD and other drugs can be explored to develop effective treatment for CSBD. This will help to deep, deeply understand the pathological mechanism of this disease. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. And our next speaker from China, uh, Kaina Zhao. Uh, uh, exploring risk factors associated with subacute uh, gerpetic neuralgia. Please, you are welcome.
Check again and choose the entire screen. Uh, do you see the slide? Yes, we see slides. Uh, you can share okay. your screen again. You can share your screen again, but choosing the entire screen, not win no, not window, just all screen, entire screen. Uh, may I begin now? Correctly, or yes, of course you can begin. You can use files, or you can share your entire screen, not window, just all screen. Okay, I will show that again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and it is like okay, then the Yes, we can see the slide, the ground objective materials and so on. Uh, yes. To like to present the uh, research and method and results of the and conclusion of and the addition. And finally, the uh, firstly, the harvest is caused by reactivation of the bacillus virus. Typical finding are localized unilateral evolution of the group vehicles on aerosomates and the post herpetic is the most common and devastating clinical condition. The harvest can usually be defined as the Life also increase the burden of the treatment and the care for patients and families. And the mechanism of herpetoster is currently thought to be a combination of peripheral and the central sensitization. And the peripheral sensitization is related with local inflammation of the skin and the damage to nerve structure caused by viral particles. And the central sensitization can be inter, uh, interpreted as a amplification of exiting pain pathway and the suppression of the descending modulatory effect. The previous findings have shown that the risk factor of the post-herpetic neurogia include age, female gender, pain in acute phase, and immunosuppressed populations, and a comorbidity such as asthma or diabetes. And there are many studies on herpes-associated pain, mostly for post-herpetic neurogia, but the definition of the post post-herpetic neurogia in China is confusing. It varies from persistent pain for one month to 10 months. And many studies include both acute and subacute herpetic neuro neurogia in the included cases. And a few studies investigated the high risk factor for the occurrence of the subacute herpetic neurogia. And in considering that the mechanism of the pain occurrence is not consistent across the different stages. So our study intends to look at the high risk factor for pain occurrence and the subacute phase of herpetoster in a real world with a special attention to the effect of mood and sleep on pain. And this is a multi-culture, multi-center perspective cohort study uh, we prospectively enrolled patients diagnosed with herpetoster from November 2020 to December 2021 and the follow up one month after the onset of the rash. And patients with severe pain apart from the shingle related pain 
and those with mental disorder uh, who were unable to cooperate during the trial were ex excluded. And the primary outcome uh, includes several scales below. The visual analog scale VES was used to measure the patient's pain intensity and a VES score of more than four can be considered as a moderate to severe pain. Patients accessed the most severe pain belt in the past tw 22 hours at the first visit and follow up. Uh, the patient's anxiety and the depression were accessed using the generalized anxiety disorder two item and the patient's healthy questionnaire two item. And a score more than three was determined as, as a depression or a, an anxiety. And in consideration of the different literacy level of the patient and the aging populations, we used three items of the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Dex to assess the patient's sleep status, which were done below. And we, we collect the demographic data uh, also include age, gender, side of onset, whether the antivirals were applied within 72 hours and the comorbidities and the pain medication. And from November uh, 2020 to January 2022, we finally have six and six forty six six hundred and forty six patients were eligible for the statistics analysis and the demographic and clinical characteristic of the patient are shown in this table. Uh, the demographic show that 50 and 6.5 percentage of the patient were female and the mean age was 53.36 and rash at the thoracic and the lumbar were more common. And a total of 208 patients were still accompanied by pain until one month after the rash. Therefore, the incidence of the subacute hepatic neuralgia was 32.19. Then is the comparison of the pain, emotional disturbance, and the sleep in patient at the baseline and one month after the rash. The pain on the first visit was 4.24, and after one month, the mean pain score reduced to 1.22. And the depression and anxiety state were combined in 10.4 and 20.7 percentage of the patient in the first visit. And uh, respectively, after, uh, after one month, uh, their pain, anxiety, depression, and the sleep improve with the most, most patient. And this following are the results of the univariate analysis, age, gender, site of onset, the comorbidities, use of antivirals drugs within 72 hours, initial VAS score and the mood and sleep status after rash onset and also the use of the pain medication within one month was all included and the results show that age uh, baseline VES score and mood and sleep after rash onset were uh, associated with the subacute neurologia and the details result is shown below. And logistic regression analysis was also performed. Another result showed that age more than 15 years old and VS more than uh, four at the fourth visit and also GED2 item score at the following up and also the poor sleep persistence and the long sleep latency is a high risk factor for the subacute pain. And this ob observation point of the study was one month after onset of the herpidoster, and it focused on the factor associated with pain affecting the subacute phase. 
and our study showed that this factor below was related to the development of the subacute herpetic neuralgia. And uh, it is the definition of the relevant high risk factor and appropriate treatment for patient before the occurrence of the peripheral and the central sensitization become an important task to prevent the occurrence of the post-herpetic neurology. And anxiety is closely related to the development of the pain. And the patient with anxiety often have autonomic symptoms such as muscle tension, sleeping problem, and behavioral symptom and can be present with a variety kind of pain. And a pos positive correlation between the anxiety and pain also have been demonstrated uh, with a higher anxiety associated with more severe post-operative pain. And it's also considered to be related to the fact that anxiety state activates release the cortisol from the HPA axis and increasing the pain sensitivity and leading to persistent pain. Also, the higher level of anxiety lead to increased attention to the perceiving pain. Uh, this along with negative emotional coping patterns and all of this are involved in the process of transition from the acute pain to the chronic pain. Next, I want to talk about the relationship between pain and sleep. A study have shown that washing sleep is driving factor of the pain and a decline of the sleep quality and the sleep quantity was associated with a two to three fold increase in the risk of developing a pain condition, also result in a small evolution in level of the inflammatory markers and a decline in the self-reported physical health status. And the sleep deprivation inhibits opioid receptor and the serotonin receptor and encephaline function in, the, in both animal experiments and the individual with insomnia disorders. And since the sleep is an important way to refresh body function, low sleep quality can lead to increased sensitivity to pain or the development of spontaneous pain symptoms, which also related to the development of the chronic pain. And finally, I want to make a conclusion with this presentation. Uh, the sample size of the study um, is relatively limited and the ob observation time is short. And in the follow-up study, our group will continue to observe and explore the relationship between mood and sleep and post-herpetic neurology in a larger sample. And clinicians should identify the patient's negative emotion and a combination of psychotherapy with uh, pharmacotherapy may relieve pain and improve patient's quality of life more effectively. And I'd like to uh, thank to my, all my co-workers for their contribution to this project. And it's my pleasure to give you my outcome. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to introduce you uh, our next speaker from Russia, Professor Grigory Usov. Uh, treatment challenges in depression, comorbid with somatic diseases. Please, Grigory Mikhailovich, you are welcome. Good day. Good day, Olga. Uh, do you listen to me? Yes, everything is okay. 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 Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good day, dear colleagues. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, conference committee, for invitation. Uh, I will speak about treatment challenges in uh, depression associated with somatic disease. And um, it's important my presentation is supported by uh, Servier Pharmaceutical uh, Company. Uh, let's start. 
Uh, what uh, do we know about prevalence of uh, depression in general practice? Uh, depressions are frequently as associated with somatic disease. In uh, this uh, cross-sectional uh, German study, more than 6 million persons with depression above uh, 14 years old were included, and control group uh, was more than 25 million persons. Authors calculated the prevalence of uh, 200 diagnoses in persons with depression as compared to matched controls uh, using prevalence ratios. Uh, the most frequent uh, associations uh, were found with uh, metabolic disorders, vision disorders, uh, cardiovascular disorders, uh, respiratory diseases, and uh, pain. In Russia, epidemiological studies uh, were completed about uh, 20 years ago. In outpatient general practice uh, in uh, Moscow, clinically significant depression were diagnosed in 25% of patients, and about 50% of uh, patients had sub-threshold uh, depression. It's very important, more than 70% of uh, depression were diagnosed uh, correctly. Uh, but in our country, there is uh, another important problem. Only small part of uh, patients with uh, depression in general practice get adequate uh, therapy. Only 10% of these patients takes antidepressants, but uh, another part uh, take um, another uh, groups of uh, different psychopharmacological uh, drugs. Of course, uh, in Russia, we know how to treat uh, depression. Our local guidelines obviously arch depression is an indication for antidepressants. But uh, general practitioners uh, faced with a lot of problems and fears in antidepressants prescribing. It's a very important problem for Russia and um, I uh, didn't see changes in the last two decades. Criteria for, criteria for ideal antidepressants for general practice are well known. Uh, we can uh, see this uh, criteria in uh, Steven Stahl uh, studies uh, and uh, in uh, articles of Russian studies. This must must be effective and uh, especially in mild and moderate depression. It uh, have to be safe and tolerable, have a low risk of uh, somatotropic adverse effect and low risk of drug interaction, especially with uh, somatotropic therapy. Uh, it's important uh, to have a simple dosage scheme for antidepressant, and uh, antidepressants uh, have to be minimal behavioral uh, toxicity. Uh, since uh, 1980s, SSRIs were the model of optimal antidepressant for general practice. SSRIs uh, were the first real psychopharmacological drugs that invaded in general practice. Uh, 20, 25 years, about 20, 25 years ago, uh, every second uh, prescribed about six antidepressants uh, recepts only in the United uh, States. Uh, SSRIs are really effective in uh, wide spectrum on depressive and anxious disorders. So these disorders have a um, high level of comorbidity with somatic disease. SSRIs uh, really safe and tolerable, have a low risk of uh, somatotropic adverse effects, uh, low or medium risk of uh, drug interaction, uh, especially in somatotropic drugs. Um, most of uh, SSRIs have a simple uh, dosage scheme and uh, SSRIs also have minimal behavioral uh, toxicity. toxicity. Uh, despite all these advantages, uh, SSRIs have important limitations. The first one is uh, their limited effectiveness. 
As we know, after the first uh, course of treatment, only 50% of patients reached remission. Uh, another 50% uh, get uh, partial remission or non-response. The second limitations of uh, the second limitation of SSRIs is weak efficacy in some core depression core symptoms of depression. Uh, the most typical residual symptoms after SSRIs treatment are sleep disorders, especially insomnia, fatigue, uh, attention and cognitive deficit, and anhedonia. Uh, new hopes in progress uh, in this problem associated with uh, new antidepressants uh, with a special mode of action. Agamelatin uh, links with uh, melatonin uh, 1 and melatonin 2 receptors and um, 5-HT2C uh, serotonin uh, receptors. Uh, for melatonin receptors, uh, agomelatin have uh, agonistic properties, and for 5-HT2C receptors, agomelatin have agomelatin has uh, antagonistic uh, properties. Uh, these properties of uh, agomelatin start a lot of secondary processes in uh, human brain. Uh, this uh, synergetic action on uh, two populations of receptors, uh, melatonin receptors and uh, serotonin receptors, um, increase level of uh, norepinephrine and uh, dopamine in uh, prefrontal cortex. It's very important for treatment of um, depression. According to the theory of functional psychopathology of uh, Steven Stahl, depression is caused by changes uh, in uh, neurotransmitter balance. Uh, according to this scheme, agomelatin increase level of melatonin, norepinephrine, and uh, dopamine. These effects provide efficacy of agomelatin in insomnia, insomnia the left part of slide, uh, fatigue and uh, attention deficit uh, by the increasing level of norepinephrine, and uh, high efficacy in anhedonia, the one of the core symptoms of, of uh, depressions, of depressions. Due to their pharmacological uh, properties, pharmacodynamics, uh, agomelatin reduce wide spectrum of depressive symptoms, including uh, typical residuals that were indicated in previous uh, slide. Uh, in short-term uh, treatment, efficacy of agomelatin and SSRIs are equal. But uh, this meta-analysis of con dimitanel from Belgium uh, showed uh, meta-analysis of long-term studies uh, about uh, 24 weeks. Uh, showed uh, advantage of agomelatin above SSRIs. This difference could be explained by unique agomelatin pharmacological properties. Um, there are two uh, famous studies of um, agomelatin action of, on uh, sleep uh, disorders. Uh, these studies were completed in Spain. Um, in Spain, uh, one of uh, these studies were non-compared, and the second one were, uh, the second one was uh, comparative study with escitalopram. In both studies, agomelatin improved sleep and improved sleep uh, architecture uh, according to the polysomnographic uh, characteristics. characteristics. Um, treatment of agomelatin was associated with uh, improvement of uh, polysomnography picture and uh, increased duration of uh, slow wave sleep, especially in the first cycle of sleep. Uh, 
A lot of studies showed high level of safety and tolerability of agamelatin. Uh, in large uh, network uh, meta-analysis of Andrea Cipriani uh, that uh, was published in uh, 2018, agamelatin was the most acceptable antidepressant among 21 drugs. Agamelatin also don't significantly impact on sexual function, uh, don't induce weight gain. Uh, weight gain. Uh, agamelatin has low risk of severe hepatic injury and uh, don't induce QT prolongation. All these properties uh, make agamelatin uh, is uh, optimal, uh, maybe optimal antidepressant for general uh, practice. And uh, another important um, uh, option, um, agamelatin treatment associated with uh, good long-term outcomes. After six months course, uh, more than 60% of patients reached functional recovery. Uh, the somatic well-being is an important part of uh, this uh, condition, functional uh, recovery. And finally, and finally, uh, depression is uh, frequently uh, accompanied, uh, frequently associated uh, by uh, other mental disorders and various somatic diseases. There is a great challenge of improving quality of uh, treatment of depression in general practice uh, in Russia. Uh, in our country, general practitioners uh, make uh, correct diagnosis in the majority of cases, but uh, optimal choice of uh, treatment is an uh, actual problem. Uh, monoamine reuptake inhibitors, including SSRIs, have significant uh, limitations and new antidepressants, uh, including alamelatin, open new opportunities to treatment of uh, depression comorbid with uh, somatic uh, disease. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Olga? Thank you very much, Grigory Mikhailovich. Uh, in our program next, uh, uh, from Japan. Unfortunately, we have not presentation. Uh, if authors uh, Etsua Fujita or maybe others want to present uh, this report, please write to the chat. And uh, our uh, now our next speaker from China and Mongolia, Engzaya Badhuyang, uh, students' mental health issues. Please, you are welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Olga. Can you hear me? Yes, of course, everything is okay. Okay, great. Distinguished professors and dear participants, good afternoon. My name is Zaya and I'm a PhD student of Department of Psychology of Southern Medical University, China. And on the behalf of team from Mongolia uh, and Dr. Batushin, I would like to congratulate all the participants and conference organizing committee. So today I will introduce our research about the mental health among Chinese and Mongolian students. How to control, oh, oh okay, okay. So uh, the presentation consists of introduction, purpose, method, result, and discussion and conclusion parts. Students who are physically and mentally healthy are more likely to be engaged in their studies and fulfill their achievement of learning and become valuable and talented young professionals in our society. This success is not only has a positive impact on their career and personal life, but also significant impact on effective prosperity of the entire country. 
The most recent study among the UK population reported that the incident prescription of anti-anxiety medicines increased from 24.9 to 43.6 per thousand person. The means of 57% increases. This is a set that has been substantial in young adults aged under 25. University students face the developmental challenge of transitioning to adulthood with the peak onset of mental health problems occurring before the age of 24 years. This suggests that undergraduate students' mental health is an important public health issue. And also social studies provides modern life extensively. So as a research, we must study and observe the factors that may have an effect on maintaining young adults' mental health and quality of life. Students usually face difficulties in adapting to academic life, which favors the presence of depressive feelings, such as loneliness and despair. Moreover, the lack of time to prepare for tests and anxiety about the scores contribute to the emergence of the adverse effects on the mental health of this population. And suicidal ideation can also occur at particularly important moments due to either the transition from adolescence to adulthood or the adversities experienced in the academic life. A systematic review conducted upon uh, 50,000 students from 40 different countries reported that the depression disorder prevalence rate was 26.1% and 24.5% prevalence rate for anxiety and had a prevalence of suicidal ideation of 18.8%. The prevalence rate of depression and anxiety among university students in Mongolia is a lack of local data. Anyway, the National Center for Health Statistics reported that the prevalence of major depressive episodes was 7.6% in the general population <clears throat> in 2017. And the suicidal rate of Mongolia was 18% 67 for each 100,000 people. While the study among medical students in China in 2019 reported that the depression was the most common mental health problems with the prevalence rate of 29%, followed by the anxiety as 21%, uh, and suicidal ideation as uh, 11%. So in this study, we aim to assess the mental health among university students from China and Mongolia and to explore the difference within two countries' samples. The study was designed as a cross-sectional study with the self-report questionnaire, and we recruited a total of over 3,000 students from China and Mongolia, and all students received course credit for their participation. Demographic information included age, gender, family living location, family financial status, major, and grade. The depression was assessed using the patient health questionnaire, and anxiety was measured by the general, generalized anxiety disorder scale, and these both scales are psychometrically assessed in a variety of studies worldwide. Descriptive analysis on demographic characteristics and main difference on main variables were using t-test and two-way analysis and statistical analysis performed using SPSS version 24. The demographic analysis revealed that 63.9% of Chinese and 72.3% of Mongolian students were female. In terms of the age group, 50% of Chinese students were aged as 19 years and younger while 73% 70, of Mongolian students were aged between 20 to 24 years old. And the majority of Chinese students were studying in the field of other medical majors, while most of the Mongolian students were majoring in general clinical medicine. The study of students in two countries found that uh, only uh, almost 5% of Chinese students had a religious belief, while half of Mongolians had a religious belief. This result indicates that compared with Chinese students, Mongolians are more religious. <clears throat> the students' family financial status was similar in both country data, as majority of students had the average level of levels of financial status. The average score of depression was uh, 5.86 
for Chinese students and 9.89 for Mongolian students. The observed depression score among Mongolian students was statistically significantly higher than the Chinese students and the student's anxiety was measured by generalized anxiety disorder questionnaire and the, the result revealed that the anxiety score among Chinese students was four point but for Mongolian students the mean score was 8.53. This reveals that <coughs> the among Chinese students was significantly lower than the Mongolian students and overall the result indicate that the Mongolian students affected more mental health issues than the Chinese students. The two-way analysis revealed that the significant interaction between nationality and family living location in depression. In other words, the significant differences, difference of family living location on depression between Mongolia and China was observed. In Mongolia, students from urban reported higher depression score than the rural area, uh, while the students from urban area in China reported higher depression score than the students from rural area. And also present study revealed that the main effect of family financial status as well as the interaction effect between nationality and family financial status in students' depression. The Mongolian students depress more than Chinese students in each level of financial status. As similar in the depression, the significant interaction between nationality and family living location in anxiety was observed. The students from urban in China reported lower anxiety score than the rural students. And also the Mongolian students experienced significantly higher anxiety than the Chinese students in all level of their family financial status. The Chinese students from rural area experienced a higher level of depression and anxiety in our study. And this finding was in line with the previous study, uh, which is researcher Yang and his team conducted. And um, in this study, even counting the financial status, the Mongolian students affected more mental health issues than the Chinese students. The one reason that could be addressed to this finding of Mongolian students is the pandemic outcomes. Due to the pandemic of COVID-19, most of the households in Mongolia are highly impacted by the negative consequences of the prolonged strict quarantine, such as uncertain economic status, limited financial sources, and loss of jobs. And for instance, the World Bank data reported 70% of those who were working pre-pandemic were losing their job by the time of June 2021 in Mongolia. So these uh, sharp changes might be significantly affected the students and their families' financial and socioeconomic status. Um, compared with Mongolia, in parallel with the disease prevention, China may have implemented more effective measurements for the prevention of socioeconomic burdens. So as a conclusion, this was the first attempt to assess the difference of experiencing mental health issues in Mongolia and Chinese data. The further study to explore the effective mechanism of the influencing factors in different cultural contexts is worthy to be suggested. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, our session is uh, over. Uh, we um, had uh, uh, an opportunity to discuss uh, general problems of uh, psychosomatic medicine. Uh, there are a lot of speakers from different countries, uh, Indonesia, Japan, China, uh, Russia, Mongolia. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you, uh, our um, speakers, for your interesting uh, presentation, for your uh, important report. Uh, and I thank uh, our participants uh, for your attention. 
and uh, I want to wish you uh, success and good luck in your future research. And I hope uh, after uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we will uh, have opportunity to meet uh, uh, offline, uh, face to face, and uh, discuss uh, actual uh, problem of psychosomatic. Uh, and uh, if uh, someone uh, want to add something, please, you are welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Goodbye.